What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Got to Eat BDG E Fantasy Football. We're talking about breakout wide receivers today for the 2019 fantasy football season. We hit the running backs. We hit them breakout running backs last Monday. And as I said, I was giving a draft guide away from someone who commented down below a top breakout running back of their choice. And I will do that midway through the video. Timestamps will be linked down below if you want to go check out who won the draft guide. I would suggest you stick around for the video. We are getting it. 2019 fantasy football wide receiver breakouts. My top five lists. We had some preseason football last night. I'm filming this on Friday. You're watching it on Tuesday. So you will obviously know a lot more than I will in the draft guide on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. I will be updating the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Bible, which is a thorough, complex, strategical analysis of how to attack your 2019 fantasy football draft. I will be up updating that article after every single preseason week. So I was on Game Pass this morning. We've been up grinding. Arr. Sorry, I'll never do that again. I'm embarrassed by myself, by my actions. So to keep me from embarrassing myself any further, let's get into the video. If you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you're on the podcast listening, a rating and review would be perfect. Let's talk wide receivers. We're going to be giving away another draft guide in this video. Every Monday we will be doing so in order to enter to win the draft guide. This will actually be a twofer. I will be giving away two things. The boys over at Auction of Champions sent me a mystery box. There is some signed piece of sports memorabilia in here. I'm going to ask a question. You have to go down below. In order to enter this is all you got to do. Go down below, hit the thumbs up button, and answer this question. Which wide receiver is most likely to usurp their teammate wide receiver one in fantasy football this year and why Chris Godwin over Mike Evans, Mike Williams over Keenan Allen or Anthony Miller over Allen Robinson, who is more likely to usurp their wide receiver one and why comment that answer down below, hit that thumbs up button and I will be unveiling whatever is in this box midway through the video. I'll be completely honest. though, if this shit comes out to be like a Julio Jones or Matt Ryan, I ain't giving it away because we could use this shit in the dungeon. I could use it as background material for here. So we'll see what's in here to decide whether or not I want to give it away. But to enter for this or the draft guide, again, which one of those wide receivers is going to usurp their wide receiver one teammate in fantasy football this year and why? Very important that you lay some big facts on the big dog. Let's get into our wide receivers. Speaking of Chris Godwin, he is the first guy on this list. Chris Godwin has shot up draft boards. He is currently being picked as the wide receiver 19 48th overall, so he's a top 50 pick this year in fantasy football. 48th overall puts you in the back half of the fourth round. I have not talked to a lot of people in the fantasy football industry that are not pegging Godwin with a breakout. It's almost like he's an automatic breakout candidate at this point with no downside. We are finally going to get to see Godwin unleashed in 2019 because Adam Humphreys is gone, Deshaun Jackson is gone, and he was playing behind them for the majority of his first two NFL seasons. This is only his third year in the NFL. Chris Godwin. During Godwin's rookie season, in 2017, he played on just 41% of the Bucks' offensive snaps. That was fourth behind Mike Evans, behind Deshaun Jackson, and behind Adam Humphreys. He finished with a respectable 525 yards, which is not bad for a rookie, and especially not someone who played on just 41% of the snaps. Last year, in his sophomore season, we saw an uptick in that playing time, went from 41% up to 57% of the snaps, still nowhere near a full-time player. Still fewer snaps than Evans and Humphreys. He finally did jump over to Sean Jackson in terms of snaps. He finished last year with 842 receiving yards, seven touchdowns, 95 targets, caught 59 of those 95 targets. Again, that was being a 57% snap player. And while ranking 78th among NFL wide receivers in catchable target rate, Fitzpatrick and Winston get your accuracy up so that Chris Godwin can prove some people right this year in fantasy football. With Humphreys now in Tennessee, Deshaun Jackson in Philly, that opens up over 11 and a half targets per game in this passing offense. Those two combined have averaged 11 and a half targets over the last two years while Godwin has been there. And we have a great sample size of what Godwin has done when one of the Bucks top wide receivers, either Mike Evans or Deshaun Jackson, has been off the field, right? There have been seven games in which 
Godwin has got to operate as the clear wide receiver too, or as the top dog, the alpha in this Bucks offense when one of those two games, one of those two guys missed time. We see here as the stat lines, most of them are very, very, very good. He went over 100 receiving yards in three of them. He had 10 targets in another one, three for 98 in another one. So almost a fourth game of 100 receiving yards. So a lot of explosion games. So you see the upside. You see who he is when he finally gets to be like a full-time player. There were two games last year where he was absolutely fucking dreadful. It was week 14 versus New Orleans. When he saw 10 targets, he caught a single target for 13 yards. And then the following week at Baltimore, one of the stiffest pass defenses, obviously, in the NFL, three targets, didn't catch a single ball. So when we look at Chris Godwin, I mean, the highs are high, very big games. The lows are low. If I had to put it one way, Chris Godwin is basically the ecstasy of fantasy football. Now, I went back, as I said, I watched NFL Game Pass this morning about some preseason games, um, and I'm excited to actually write that article for the Bible and the draft guide, because there's some guys that I'm getting really, really, really high on after just the first preseason week, and guys, don't re don't react crazily to the shit that you see in preseason games, especially in week one, like the fact that Mike Davis started over D uh, David Montgomery, Jordan Howard over Miles Sanders, Frank Gore over Devin Singletary, rookie running backs, guys, they very rarely ever get the first starts with the first teams, especially in week one. They let the veterans do that. There's a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot of takeaways, and I have some strong takes coming away from just like eight snaps with the starters that we saw. Anyways, I went back and watched week 14 and week 15 of last year, the Bucks games, to see what happened with Godwin in those games. Like, why was he so bad. Uh, and those bad games are going to happen, right, to any wide receiver. But those are particularly really bad games. Like one catch on 10 targets, not what you want to see. So on those 10 targets, six of them were very bad passes or tipped by the defenders. Six of them right away you could rule off not even being catchable. So that obviously is not going to help Chris Godwin pile up those stats when he should have, right? A couple of them, he was just smothered by Eli Apple. Um, he also dropped a ball. He dropped the ball on a big hit and he dropped the ball. that just hit him in the hands. It just wasn't a good game. Some of it can be attributed to Winston. Um, there was a few deep passes that, you know, had they not been overthrown, Godwin could have had a much bigger game. It didn't happen. So it was a bad game. The second game at Baltimore is naturally a, a very tough matchup versus a very tough pass defense, of course. Conditions were really bad that day in terms of like rain and the weather. That entire game combined to see 288 passing yards. That was just not a pass heavy game. It was a defensive oriented run heavy Ground and pound, obviously, with Baltimore. Really bad weather conditions. Another bad game is a lot of excuses, but you want to see players rack up the stats regardless. I will preface this with a few things, right? I don't think Godwin is good enough to be uh, an elite wide receiver in fantasy yet from a talent standpoint, right? What, what I saw in those games was that he had a lot of trouble separating from defenders, and it felt like he was consistently smothered. Every time Winston was trying to force a ball into him, there was someone like on his hip, and he couldn't create separation for a lot of the time. I also don't think this offense is is in store for something magical. Like we want to talk about Bruce Arians coming in and I'll, I'll talk about Godwin's role in this offense a little bit later, but Bruce Arians coming in and everyone's like, oh my God, this is going to be such a prolific fucking offense. They have not ranked within the top 10 scoring offenses. Even last year when they were like the second or third best passing offense statistically in the league, they have not been a top 10 scoring offense in the NFL since the year 2000. That's almost 20 fucking years. So just assume that we're going to get a prolific offense because Bruce Arians is there. Might not be the case. We're so high on this passing offense, right? We think Godwin's going to break out. OJ Howard's going to break out. Mike Evans is a legit wide receiver one. There's so many good parts of this offense, yet we don't actually know that this offense is going to be that good. We had Dirk Cutter. We had Todd Monk in there last year who passed the ball at a rate as high as basically any tandem of coaches in the NFL. They are not going to be more pass heavy come 2019 than they were last year. It's not like they're going from Mike McCoy to Bruce Arians. That I could get excited about. But you're going from one of the most pass heavy coaches already to another pass heavy downfield attack coach. So I don't see there being a big difference or a big jump up statistically because between Fitzpatrick and Jameis Winston, when you combine their totals, they were like a top, I, I believe they were the, uh, the number two fantasy quarterback overall if you just combine their raw totals. So you're not getting an upgrade in terms of stats from the passing standpoint. When I think of Godwin, I think expectations do need to be relaxed a little bit. The reason I am encouraged by Arians coming in has nothing to do with his scheme or nothing to do with the fact that I think they're going to be more pass heavy. It's the fact that he keeps saying they're not taking Godwin off the field. So he's going to be a full-time snap player when the last few years he has not been even close to that. And they're saying that he's going to be running from the slot. So for someone that I subjectively saw having trouble separating Playing in the slot gives you a massive boost, right? Because defenders play off you a little bit. They don't really come up and do press coverage in the slot. 
You also don't have to face cornerback ones like the best outside wide uh, cornerbacks go against like a Mike Evans. So you're not you're playing against a slot cornerback, which is usually the second at best cornerback on the team, usually like the third or fourth guy, right? They're in for like nickel packages or something like that. When you look at um, a lot of the slot guys that have succeeded in the NFL recently, you look at like the Juju's, Adam Thielen's, Tyler Boyd, Cooper Cup. None of them are like great athletes. None of them are that fast. None of them are that quick, but they're in the slot and they get tons of separation because naturally that's how it works in the slot, right? None of them are speedsters, like sub four, four guys. So I think Chris Godwin, who has much better athleticism than these guys will excel because you see a guy like Michael Thomas, who has great athleticism. They use him in the slot at like a a 40% clip and he absolutely explodes in the slot. I will say again, though, those takes of me saying he can't separate are completely subjective to what I saw on film. So if you think he's a great separator, then that's your opinion. That's fine. I'm just saying what I saw on film. And I will say Matt Harmon, who does reception perception, he works for Yahoo. He does the reception perception in the ultimate draft kit by the fantasy footballers, loves Godwin from a route running standpoint. I will quote him. And he says, a favorite during the 2017 prospect charting, Godwin's strengths have transferred to the NFL level. His 81.8% contested catch rate, 88th percentile, from the 2018 sampled games is a reminder of his trump card trait. Of course, let's not forget that this is a dedicated route technician and a strong separator as well, hosting a 73.2% success rate versus man coverage, which was in the 87th percentile last year. So obviously he saw something different than I did. And when you look at the athleticism, the separation and the routes running successfully makes sense. 442, 40 yard dash at 6'1, 210 pounds, puts him in the 90th percentile, has great burst, has great agility, good catch radius. He dominated in college at Penn State, he had a young breakout age. So he checks all the boxes that you want to see as a prospect at, uh, at the wide receiver position. Godwin playing in a slot, given his athletics, he, he should thrive as a PPR option playing from the slot, right? So what about in standard leagues? Those eight yard, you know, gains that that you get out of the slot, those check downs and stuff, don't really do a lot for us in a standard or really even that much in a half PPR league. But Godwin seems like a guy that could find the end zone and get into the end zone because he's so heavily involved down there for the for this Bucks teams. So listen to the stat I found. At this point, it's about a week ago. So last year, wide receiver targets or just pass catching targets inside the opponent's 10-yard line. So very close to the end zone. Chris Godwin had 11 10 zone targets. Mike Evans, OJ Howard, Deshaun Jackson combined for 11 10 zone targets. Those 11 10 zone targets were tied for the third most among all NFL wide receivers last year. And again, he played on 57% of the Bucks snaps in 2018. He didn't convert a single one of his 10 zone targets during his rookie year, but he was still second on the team in 10 zone targets. So it just shows you that Winston is a fan of using a guy like Chris Godwin down there and it's consistency. We're seeing it year over year of him being one of the top targeted guys down there Um, near the end zone and he wasn't playing on a full slate of snaps and if we're being honest like Cameron Bray just needs to get the fuck out of Tampa Bay like there's 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 no reason for him to be there no one likes him he just causes anxiety for everybody but he's probably still going to be there so that kind of sucks but regardless I think Godwin is in line to see a massive uptick in playing time and volume is such a big part of succeeding in fantasy football if he's playing in the slot with Deshaun Jackson and Adam Humphreys gone opening up a triple digit number of targets right 150 to 200 targets in this offense where Arians which we've seen what he did with a guy like Larry Fitzgerald putting him in the sport in the slot right he was a top 10 fantasy wide receiver for three years in a row once he made that move albeit he was the only real option in that passing game when they have other options here in Tampa Bay so I'm not going to use those stats as like the baseline I think the floor for Godwin I I think a lot of people are drafting Godwin because they like his ceiling. If I'm drafting Godwin, it's because I like his floor. I think we'll see him realistically finish with maybe 75 to 85 catches. I think his range of outcomes is anywhere from 1,000 yards, probably up to 1,200 yards as his max, and maybe 8 to 10 touchdowns. We saw him score 7 touchdowns last year in limited playing time. So I think that is absolutely within his range of outcomes. Chris Godwin, breakout wide receiver, number one. Would I draft him at the end of the fourth round? Uh debatable. I would much rather have them in the fifth round if possible. So again, if y'all are enjoying this video, make sure you hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you are new rating and review on the podcast, let's open up this box. I've been excited because I've had this box for a minute. Thank you uh, for uh, to Jeff and the boys over at Auction of Champions, that team. Now, Auction of Champions is a website where um, they basically post tons of sports memorabilia and you can go bid on them. They don't take 
fees, credit card fees. They don't take fees for when you win the purchase or whatever. The price you see is the price you pay. They have a lot of cool stuff on there. I'm actually looking at their website right now. We got a Vlad Guerrero Jr. signed jersey. We got Peyton Manning official signed football. They got all different sports, all different signatures, memorabilia. So make sure you go check them out. It's auctionofchampions.com. I will link them down below if you want to go through that link. That would be helpful to your boy. Let's open this bad boy up. We just do. Wah -wah. I'm going to let y'all see it before me. I'm going to let you guys see it. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let you guys see it. And then I want you to comment down below whether or not you think I'm going to give it away based on whether or not I like this player. Feels like a jersey. Ah! I can't see it. I, I have no recollection of what's going on inside here. Here is the... Uh, so I, I, I want to hear your guesses whether or not you think I'm going to give this away. I'll give it a second. Go down there. Drop a comment. Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, God. Damn! You couldn't even see it. But this is a Saquon Barkley signed jersey, bro. If I don't give this to Snacks, he might literally fucking kill me. But I'm also not going to give it to him because I kind of want to keep this. Fuck. I can give away this t-shirt to y'all. Uh, this is an auction of champions t-shirt. So this will be the giveaway that we do. There's a draft guide giveaway. There's a t-shirt giveaway. Yo, let's go. Saquon Barkley. Hey. All right. Yo, Jeff, you guys are the shit. This is a fire fucking jersey. I knew they were sending me over a fantasy stud as like the sports memorabilia piece. But uh, they didn't tell me they was about to send me over the top fantasy player for the next 10 years or so. So, we ain't going to give this away. I'm going to sell it to y'all. Bidding starts down below in the comment section. Thank you, Jeff. Go check out auctionofchampions.com where they have the best prices on all sports memorabilia. They got all types of dozens and hundreds and thousands and billions of... <laughs> wow, they got a fucking amazing uh, thing on here. I just saw this. The Navy SEAL who killed Bin Laden autographed the Time magazine of Bin Laden's face on there. That's fucking incredible. I might actually buy that and then give that away as an auction. So auctionofchampions.com. Go check them out. Thank you guys. Y'all are the best. Wide receiver number two on the breakout list. Y'all know I love my boy Christian Kirk out in Arizona. We saw Kyler Murray chop it up and dice it up in his preseason debut looking good. Quick hitting routes. Don't care that Christian Kirk didn't catch a ball. All I wanted to see that was Kyler Murray had that offense down pat and he was getting the ball out accurately, quickly. That's all I need to know from my boy Christian Kirk. Shooting up draft boards, another guy, probably because I haven't stopped talking about him all summer. Wide receiver 30 right now, 74th overall. He's going to be Arizona's top dog in this receiving core. Uh, I don't think that's a question. In my eyes, I don't think there's any way that he is not the leading receiver on this team if he stays healthy. He was a sensational college prospect. We already knew that when you're looking at the numbers. A breakout age of 18 years old. A college dominator in the 73rd percentile. Now, I want you guys to understand this. Now, this is a, a, a dynasty tip, but also just some analytics to show you what I think Christian Kirk is capable of in terms of his ceiling. And there's a reason his best comparable player is Stephon Diggs on here. The list of NFL players that came into the league with a breakout age younger than 19 in the top third percentile in college dominator rating, right? In the 67th percentile or above, which Christian Kirk knocks off both of those things and did that at a power five conference school is ridiculously exclusive. So, young breakout age, very high college dominator, which means you accounted for a lot of your team's stats in college and did that at a good school with good competition. He did it at Texas A&M. That list of NFL players that meets that criteria, Des Bryant, DJ Moore, Hakeem Nix, Larry Fitzgerald, Keenan Allen, Paul Richardson, Amari Cooper, Sidney Rice, Jordan Matthews, Nikhil Harry, Tyler Boyd, DeAndre Hopkins, Brandon Cooks, Earl the Pearl, Bennett, Kenny Britt, Stephon Diggs, Allen Robinson, and your boy Christian Kirk. That list is almost fucking immaculate. Now, when we look back at last year, Christian Kirk's rookie season ended with a broken foot following their week 13 game. He had a 10-game sample size playing with Josh Rosen, though. And when you look at the splits, they're not that bad, right? Six targets, 3.8 receptions, 11.5 PPR fantasy points. If you pace those 10 games out to a 16-game pace, 
That's nearly 100 targets and 900 receiving yards. And keep in mind, one, that he was a rookie. Two, how bad and slowly paced this offense was. And he was on targets. He was on pace for 100 targets and 900 receiving yards as a rookie in this horrible offense. And how much more accurate downfield is Kyler Murray going to be than Josh Rosen? Like, ridiculously. Kyler Murray and Kirk actually played together at Texas A&M back in 2015 during his freshman year. Kyler wasn't the full-time starter yet, but they were on the field together for around 650 of Kyler's passing yards, so the two have a little bit of connection. Back to how impressive those numbers truly were as a rookie while in this offense, I found this crazy yet unsurprising stat as I was looking at how to identify top 24 fantasy wide receivers and such. Looking back last year, the top 24 fantasy wide receivers from 2018, this is on my Twitter. If you're not following me, make sure you're following me at Nick underscore BDGE. 19 of the 24 top 24 fantasy wide receivers last year, so almost 80% of them were on teams whose offensive pace, seconds per play, ranked inside the top half of the NFL teams. 14 of the 24 were on teams whose offensive pace ranked inside the top 12. Last year, Arizona ranked 20th in pace in terms of seconds per play in neutral game scripts and 28th when trailing by seven or more. When you're trailing, you should be hurrying up. They were 28th in seconds per play when they were trailing by seven or more, which was literally the majority of their season pretty much. They ranked 31st in offensive plays per game. Only Adam Gases' Dolphins ran fewer plays. He was set up for failure, but still dominated in a per-game pace, guys. You want players on teams whose pace is very high tempo, and this is what we're going to get, right? We have Cliff Kingsbury coming in as the head coach. He is installing the air raid offense, and they're going to run so many more plays this year than they did in the previous year. What we know for sure is this Cardinals offense is going to be up-tempo. It's going to be fast-paced, which means good things for fantasy wide receivers, including your boy Christian Kirk. Scott Barrett of Pro Football Focus just put out a phenomenal article called 96 Stats, Three Fantasy Football Stats for Every NFL Team for 2019. I will link that down below. You might have to have a PFF uh, subscription in order to access it. I'm not sure, but from his article, this is one of the stats. Last season, and among all 64 Power 5 teams, Cliff Kingsbury's Texas Tech offense ranked third in snaps per game with almost 85 snaps per game, fourth in pass percentage, 58%, and fifth in targets to running backs, 78. During Cliff's tenure in Lubbock, the Red Raiders featured a passing attack that ranked in the top 10 in the country in all six of his seasons as their coach ranked in the top 20 nationally for total offense in all six seasons and finish in the top 25 in scoring five of six times. The offenses averaged at least 30 points per game, 470 total yards per game, and 300 passing yards per game in all six seasons. The Red Raiders averaged over 500 yards of offense in four seasons and over 450 passing yards twice. Dating back to his first offensive coordinator job at Houston in 2011, a Kingsbury-led offense has never finished outside the top 20 in the nation in total offense, has never finished outside the top 15 in passing offense. He led the country in scoring and yards twice. We can go on about as long as a fucking 18 play drive lasts here, talking about Cliff Kingsbury and the success that he's had from an offensive standpoint. I don't care about the defense. They are going to be bad, especially without Patrick Peterson for the first majority of the season. Cliff's air raid offense runs through versatile athletic wide receivers. Kirk is the perfect fit because of his speed, his versatility. In this air raid offense, he'll be running both on the outside and on the inside because they're going to use five wide receiver sets. They're going to use four wide receiver sets. They're going to use three wide receiver sets, which means there will be multiple slot guys a lot of the time out there. So Kirk's a guy that can run outside. He can run inside. He has 4.47 40-yard dash speed. So that's way more than enough speed to separate from defenders over the middle. But he also played downfield last year a lot. He played on the outside a lot. He ran 71% of his routes on the outside. So you put him in the Kirk, naturally he's going to be able to separate from these defenders. If you put him in the inside, <laughs> not on the Kirk. If you put him in the inside, he's naturally going to be able to separate from these defenders. If you put him on the outside, he already has NFL experience. And we saw him succeed last year doing so. He had 100% of the Cardinals' touchdowns of 40-plus yards last year. He had a 20.4% target share in the offense last year. That is phenomenal for a rookie. And he was super successful against pretty much all coverage types that are thrown his way. When you look at Matt Harmon, again, his reception perception, Kirk did not disappoint. He had an 82% success rate versus zone and nearly a 70% success rate versus man coverage as a rookie. He can do it all. There's a reason his closest, closest player comp is Stefan Diggs. Like I already said, the offense is going to open him up, and that's all we're hearing out of camp. He's been the best wide receiver, clearly. He's, him and Fitz are the number one and two guys. We don't even know who the number three guy is. It was Andy Isabella, but he's been dealing with some kind of knee issue. Keyshawn Johnson has been 
uh, hyped up a little bit. So it's clear that Kirk and Fitz are the one and two there in a high-powered, pass-heavy offense. I'm all in on Kirk this year. So Kirk is my number two breakout wide receiver. If y'all are enjoying the big facts, though, again, hit that thumbs up, please. If you think I'm really fucking annoying, also go hit that thumbs up. I'm sorry. This is just the way that YouTube knows that it's a good video. If you think it's a quality video, that's how y'all help me out. Curtis Samuel, currently the wide receiver 37, 91st overall. He's like an eighth round pick, ninth round pick right now. He won't be for long. There's going to be so much hype coming out about Curtis Samuel over the next few weeks that he's going to eventually end up being a six or seven round pick by the time real drafts come. Samuel is not a guy, admittedly, that I loved coming into the offseason. But man, the more and more I research and the more I read, whether it's from articles or blog posts or listen via podcasts or beat reports out of training camp, the more I've come to the conclusion that there is no chance in hell that I'm going to be picking DJ Moore in the fifth round while Curtis Samuel's ADP still is at an eighth or ninth round price. There's no chance I'm going to be doing that. I will take Curtis Samuel at a three or four round discount. Samuel entered his rookie season with that deadly August hamstring pull. Guys, this is, this is the time of the year, man. If a hamstring occurs in August, especially by the time you guys see this, which will be August 12th, I believe, you guys almost go on the do not draft list. I don't care how good the player is. If he pulls a hammy right now, a calf strain right now, you got to stay away from them. He had the August hamstring pull his rookie year, eventually led to an ankle injury. There's always these compensation injuries that come because you try to rush yourself back when you're not ready yet. Eventually led to a back injury. And before you know it, his rookie season ended with nothing to show for it, eight appearances. 2018, he entered the year with some kind of heart issue. It kept him out until week five. But from that point on, Curtis Samuel was legitimately good. He averaged more fantasy points per game on the year than DJ Moore did. He scored double-digit half PPR fantasy points in more than 50% of his games in seven of the 13 games, while DJ Moore only did that 31% of the time. He's fully healthy going into this year. He's a ridiculously explosive athlete, and he's just 23 years old coming into his third NFL season. I mean, you just look at the numbers, man. 4-3-1 speed, 92nd percentile for weight-adjusted speed score. The guy is an absolute explosive playmaker. I will say this though, there are a lot of numbers being thrown around and compared. And even I just did that in terms of like points per game with the two Carolina wide receivers, DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel, you know, and especially about how they finished like, oh, over the last eight weeks, Samuel was out targeting DJ Moore and I had more receiving yards and blah, 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 blah. Here's the thing though, like Cam Newton for one, for one thing, didn't play the last couple games. So taking those stats and splitting them out at the end of the year is stupid because Cam Newton wasn't playing. Uh, also, you could tell by like week 13, 14, 15, Cam Newton's shoulder was completely shot. He was not throwing the ball downfield. It was all dump offs. So I don't actually think we really got a good sample size of what this offense is going to look like with both of these guys playing full time because they didn't become full time players until like week 10 last year and with a healthy cam. So I'd expect both of them to be the wide receiver one, wide receiver two in this offense. I don't know who's who yet. And Cam Newton actually healthy. So I don't think we got a legit sample size to really break down the stats and the splits and be like, oh, well, he out targeted him, blah, 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 blah. But what you're hearing out of Carolina about Samuel has been wild. Beat reporters are going nuts about him. Coaches are going nuts. The front office is going nuts. They are even suggesting that he might be the true number one out here in Carolina, right? And listen, if there's one takeaway that I say with every fucking video, it's do not buy into Twitter clips. 10 second Twitter clips of your favorite player running a route mean literally fucking nothing, nothing to me. But I'll tell you what, bro. Curtis Samuel looked good as hell in those Twitter clips. Ron Rivera is talking about how far along he has come compared to previous years. He said he is light years above where he was coming into his rookie year and last year. Norv Turner coming out and said Samuel is becoming an outstanding route runner. And that is echoed again by Matt Harmon of Yahoo who does reception perception. This is his synopsis from Samuels' reception perception from this year. Matt Harmon basically pegged Curtis Samuel as his number one like breakout candidate at the wide receiver position for this year. Samuels was the most stunning positive result from 2018 charting process. If you still have any shred of belief that he is some sort of gadget hybrid player based on his role at Ohio State, let it go. Samuels' is blistering 76.6% success rate versus man coverage score puts him at the 94th percentile among players charted in reception perceptions history. He faced man coverage on 68.4% of his charted routes as the flanker receiver. Samuel has strong release moves off the line of scrimmage when he is pressed with a 74.6% success rate, which is in the 79th percentile. It's impossible to watch the 2018 Carolina Panthers and not realize that right now, Samuel is clearly the best route runner and separator on the team. He has also demonstrated tremendous ball skills and tight coverage, seeing a contested catch attempt on 35.2% of his sample targets and hauling in 73.7% of them. 
It is not a stretch at all to say Samuels looks like an early career Stephon Diggs. Not only do they run the same routes or run routes the same way, but their reception perception results are strikingly similar. And this is, <coughs> that was all quoted right from Matt Harmon. Again, you can get reception perception in the Fantasy Footballers Ultimate Draft Kit, UDK. Um, and then something I found within the UDK was the guys that had a higher success rate versus man coverage last year than Samuel, a very short list. Michael Thomas, Odell Beckham, Devontae Adams, Antonio Brown, Stefan Diggs, and Keenan Allen. That is it. Then it's Curtis Samuel. Right underneath Curtis Samuel, Julio Jones, Tyreek Hill, Calvin Ridley. Those Stefan Diggs comparisons may be warranted. And it's not like you think of Curtis Samuel as like this gadget player and you said get that out of your mind. Because Curtis Samuel is not like 175 pounds. He's 5'11", almost 6 foot, 196 pounds. So almost he's almost 6 foot, 200 pounds. And had he had two more pounds at the combine or had he, you know, measured in a uh, half an inch taller, you would be looking at him probably as a much different player. He's not that, I mean, he's a little bit smaller than DJ Moore, but he's really not a very small size wide receiver compared to a lot of the guys you're seeing have success in the NFL these days. Now, the team overall really doesn't have much on the outside. Um, and I don't think for a second that Greg Olson is going to hold up in 2019. His, I think his foot or an ankle or something is going to blow up. Um, so I don't have him projected for a lot of targets. I think this could legitimately be a funnel where we saw like Sanders and Demarius Thomas have, you know, uh, post numbers greater than 50% of the team target share. I think we're going to see a monster funnel to Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey on those dump offs. So we're going to see outside targets to Samuel, DJ Moore. I realistically wouldn't be surprised if going into next year, we're talking about Samuel and DJ Moore as, you know, a top fantasy wide receiver duo, right? The same way we look at Diggs and Thielen, maybe not that ceiling, maybe not yet, but I think um, we're going to be looking at these two and being like, they're two of the top fantasy wide receiver duos in the entire league. So I'm not looking to grab both guys and I'll take Samuel over more four rounds later all day and tomorrow. But if their ADPs, you know, end up being fifth round versus sixth round or sixth round versus seventh round, the debate I think becomes a little bit closer. There's just too much smoke and too much fire coming out of Samuels, his corner for him not to be a thing right now. So those are my top three breakout wide receivers. We'll, we'll talk about uh, a few like honorable mentions here at the end. Uh, and again, if you want all of my data, all of my big facts, that can be found in the draft guide on bigdogsdraftguide.com. It's got the top sleepers, it's got the top busts. It's got my must draft players round by round. It's all updated throughout the entire summer. My top 250 rankings for PPR, half PPR for standard. It's got the big dogs got to eat Bible, of course, keeping you in the know after every preseason week. Y'all don't even have to watch preseason games. I, I'll do that for you, and then you'll be able to read my write-up. Takes the thinking out of fantasy football. It's literally the only thing you need for your 2019 fantasy football season. Go cop that now. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Hit that thumbs-up button down below. I love you. I know I'm so fucking annoying with these plugs, but it's only because I'm broke, bitch. Honorable mentions. Number one, man, Kiki QT was on this list, but it looks like he went down with a semi-serious injury last night in their game. By the time you guys are watching this, you will know what QT's injury is. They do have a report out right now. Um, it's not a major ankle injury, but we I still need to know more because, again, I'm filming this Friday, so I don't have that much information. If it's not that serious and it's just an ankle injury, hopefully he can be healed up. Um, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't like a hamstring pull or it almost looked like a torn ACL for a second. If it's an MCL sprain, I believe he can rest for about three or four weeks and be good to go. If this, if, if it is something, you know, keep staying tuned, go, go follow Dr. Jesse Morse on Twitter. Um, and he will keep you in the know when it comes to QT and his injuries and his return timetable. If it's something that can be healed after three to four weeks and QT's ADP drops really significantly, I will probably be drafting him in like the ninth. He's already like a ninth round pick, but like the 10th, 11th, 12th round. If he can come back at full strength, I'm all in on this guy. Um, but right now, obviously, the injury really makes me nervous about him. So I'm not going to be taking him where he had been going for a long time. Marquez Valdez-Scantling is the wide receiver two in Green Bay. Talk about Jerron Mileson all you want. Guys, Jerron Mileson lost the wide receiver two role to Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Like, he beat him out for the second wide receiver role. Getting demoted is not a good thing. Just because he's in the slot now doesn't mean that he's the number two target. He got demoted. They're telling you that Marquez Valdez-Scantling is better than Jerron Mileson which means in two wide receiver sets, he's going to be on the field more. He's a much more explosive athlete. I'm not going to break it down too much because I've talked about MBS so much this summer already. You can go check out any of the previous wide receiver videos on my channel if you want an in-depth breakdown like I did for the first three guys on Marquez Valdez-Scantling. But I will go MBS over John Allison all day and then tomorrow. 
And we have some other guys that you guys will probably be kind of um, hyped up about. Dante Pettis on the Niners. I get the hype. He was good down the stretch last year. He's an exciting young player. And he pr- probably sits atop the wide receiver depth chart by default. But there's a lot of mystery going on here. One, because we don't know what we're getting from Pettis. Like, can he be a true number one in the NFL? I don't know. Uh, George Kittle is the number one weapon there. So even if he is the number one wide receiver, he's not the number one pass catcher in this offense. But this offense should be better with Jimmy G. However, when Pettis kind of broke out last year, it wasn't with Jimmy G. So we don't know what their their chemistry is like, right? You also, like, I don't know what these weird reports coming out of San Fran are, but Pettis supposedly has been running with the second team offense. I'm not going to buy too much into that unless they consistently keep coming out with those reports. But that is a little weird for someone who's supposed to be like the clear cut wide receiver one here. Um, so Pettis, I'm not as high on a lot of people are. Anthony Miller was one of my favorite breakout candidates coming into last year. If there's one lesson that I took away from the Anthony Miller L, it's that it is very hard to break out, especially as a rookie, when you don't have an accurate quarterback. And all reports out of camp is that Mitch Trubisky is uh, still not accurate. And that Bears blanket, by the way, ain't mine. That's my roommate. So I ain't a Bears fan. Falcons rise up, baby. J.J. Arcega white side of the Eagles, man. I don't know. I just love this guy. He's been dominating practice, apparently, especially by the red zone. We already knew he was going to be a dominant force down there. However, oh, man, Arcega white side missed a beautiful one-handed diving catch, like the first play of the Eagles preseason, or his first play last night by, like, an inch. The ball kind of bobbled and hit the ground, but, oh, he almost made that play. He is, man, I really, really like this kid. I know he's the third guy behind Alshon, Deshaun Jackson, and Aguilar. But I think at some point this year, right, Alshon's dealt with a plethora of injuries. Deshaun Jackson's dealt with his injuries and he's older. Nelson Aguilar, I just don't think is really that good or consistent. At some point this year, Jaws is going to be one of the top waiver wire pickups in season long leagues. I don't know if I'll necessarily want to draft him because it might not come until week six or week eight, but have your eye on him. When someone gets hurt in the Seagulls offense, Jaws is going to step in and be a popular waiver wire pick. That's all I got for you all today. All right. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, again, hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new to enter into the giveaway. Who's it going to be? Is it Chris Godwin over Evans? Is it Mike Williams over Keenan Allen? Is it Anthony Miller over Allen Robinson? Who is going to take the wide receiver one role in their offense? Drop a comment down below. NY. Hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Auctionofchampions.com. Go check them out. I will not be giving away that Saquon Barkley jersey. I'm sorry. That's all we got for you today. forgot to do the draft guy giveaway winner from last Monday's video. That is Mr. Gabe Haas spitting out a bunch of nonsense about Aaron Jones. Not really a bunch of nonsense, some good big facts about how anytime he plays over 50% of the snaps, he averaged over 17 and a half PPR, half PPR fantasy points. That's some good shit. That's some big facts right there, Gabe Haas. Hit me in the emails and congratulations, sir. Again, if you want to enter for next week's giveaway, answer the question I previously stated.